Okay. Perfect. And we have to approve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you for being here today. Um, I'm Penny Beeman with the Uber Paws of Love in Michigan. And we have Cindy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Cindy Campbell with Cindy Campbell Dog Training in Clovis, California. And then we also have a special guest for you today, um, Dr. Holly Tet. I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, so I'm the owner and founder of Paws Up Dogs, which is a UK-based dog behavior company. And I'm also a clinical psychologist. All right, thank you. So we just kind of want to do some, and I'm using this talk today as a preliminary for a workshop that Cindy and I are coordinating together. And so we just kind of want to go over some general things that, you know, kind of affect us as service dog handlers when we're owner training our own service dogs. And that are important to think about when we're considering or in the process of training our service dogs to alert to certain medical conditions. So um, there's a couple of common medical conditions that might be more prevalent, but the workshop that we're doing is not specific to that. So a lot of them will be of a psychiatric nature, whether it's PTSD or anxiety, or you know, there's hundreds of other conditions out there. And this workshop is basically designed to cover all of them and so they may not cover every single aspect of every illness out there, but a lot of them have several common general things that are very relevant to service dogs and service dog handlers. So that's kind of our goal today. And so we're gonna start right out with, um, Holly, I'm just gonna let you take over with the common. So if you have a psychiatric issue or some similar whether it's, it may not even be a psychiatric issue, but you have some kind of mental activity that's changing your day, even like my brain fog that I have with my chronic migraines can greatly affect my day. So any issue like that, um, if Holly, do you wanna kind of talk about some of the things that people tend to do either just before or early onset of those type of episodes that we may wanna watch out for? Yeah, for sure. Um, as you said, it's a huge kind of, there's a huge scope and we're all really different. So I think you've got to really kind of examine yourself and start to notice what your own patterns are, because they'll be very different from someone who might have the exact same condition or diagnosis that you have. Um, but a lot of the common things that I see, so you might start to actually notice things inside your body first. So you might start to feel some sensations in your body. So it could be things like, I feel like a tightening of your chest or a thudding in your head, kind of feels like your pulse almost thudding in your head. Um, you might start to feel a little bit short of breath or as if you're, you can feel your pulse rate rising a little bit, kind of like how we would associate with any kind of feeling of panic or fear, really. You might start to notice it inside first. Some people describe like a, um, a very kind of dull ache in their stomach. Um, some people feel things more in their chest area. So you've really got to kind of almost scan your body <laughs> to be aware about where it is for you that you start to notice those things. Um, other things could be sweaty palms or slightly shaky palms or feeling a bit kind of trembly, that kind of thing. So there, there sort of come some of the more physical symptoms um, and there's various other ones as well, um, depending on who you are as a person. And then there might be some things that we actually feel like we're experiencing inside our mind, so separate a little bit from our body. Um, that could include things like feeling as though you're not real or the surroundings around you aren't real. So it could be as simple as that table just doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look how it normally looks. I'm not quite sure if it's real in the sense that I normally experience it. And that might sound quite strange if you haven't had that sort of experience or sensation, but it's almost like as if you stepped into like a world that was made of foam or something like that, <laughs> like a kid's playground, but it can feel a little bit unnerving and unsettling. Um, a sensation that your thoughts are 
running like crazy so you're you're getting all these thoughts zipping into your mind but you can't quite catch hold of any of them and think of one thing at a time so there's lots of things kind of racing around um or it could just be a general sense of feeling unsafe so a sort of uh, an idea in your head that something bad is going to happen but you aren't quite sure what you just feel as though I just don't feel safe in this situation and that could be in your own home or that could be out in public which is often a bit more scary because there's often other people around and things like that and you might be worrying about how they're looking at you and stuff like that so there's just a few I can go on <laughs> but that's just a few things that come to mind at first really I think that gives us some kind of categories that people can start to you know, think about how the body reacts and where, and where they should start looking for things that they might do if they're not sure what they do ahead of time. Mm, so yeah, um, all of us here are service dog handlers. So we know that our service dogs do quite a bit for us. And some of the things that you described are definitely things that our service dogs may be able to help us with. But I think we also need to take a look at the things that our service dogs probably shouldn't be exposed to. And I know I want to talk a little bit about young dogs. Um, there's, a, I don't know if it's true in the UK, but in the US, there's a lot of push for teams to get their dogs working at a very early age. And so then there's a lot of feedback from trainers saying, don't expose your dog to any kind of anxiety or psych related tasks until they're two years old which I mean, in theory, probably is sound and amazing. I get it. But I also know in reality, that's probably near impossible for people that maybe are, have no idea when their episodes are coming on. You know, so while you want to do your best to avoid engaging with your dog when you're not quite yourself, you don't want, you know, you want to prevent it as much exposure as possible, it's going to happen. So I think maybe having that conversation of allowing people to forgive themselves for things they may have done when they weren't necessarily in full control of themselves is a good thing to discuss as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this goes for everything in life whether you have a diagnosis or not there will be times when stress is incredibly high and we aren't in control of what might be happening in our lives and we're human so we react negatively sometimes and your dog may get caught up in the crossfire of an argument you have with your partner or your friend or your child and it's not ideal we wouldn't want to put them in that situation if we could possibly help it but sometimes life happens so I think if you get caught in the cycle of guilt it's really self-perpetuating so let's say you had you were really really anxious and you were maybe shouting or something like that and your dog was frightened and you just keep getting that image in your head over and over of the, the look on your dog's face and you feel so terribly guilty chances are the next time that happens it might be just as bad or even worse because you've got guilt playing in the back of your mind as well so if we can try and find a way to forgive ourselves of those moments dogs are incredibly forgiving by nature if so long as you spend the vast amount of time that you have being able to provide them with the best lives they could possibly have and we might talk about what some of that might look like a little bit later but meeting all of their needs on the odd occasion where something happens outside of your control that's all it is something that's outside of your control and you can kind of make it up to them a little bit later so I kind of think of it in the same way as if I accidentally shouted or snapped at a friend or family member I'd feel really bad but I'd need to find a way to forgive myself Something that I find really helpful, and I've done this with my own dogs, is actually, it might sound a bit silly, but to sit down with my dog when I'm feeling totally calm and much, much later, and just apologize using words. <laughs> so just say, hey, buddy, I'm really sorry. That was out of character. It was nothing to do with you. Now, you may say, oh, my dog doesn't understand words, Holly. Well, there is some evidence to suggest that they do understand some sentences, but regardless of that, they understand tone, they understand intention, and it will make you both feel better to have that kind of bonding moment together. So that's something that I like to kind of invite people to do as well, I think. Yes, that's really, really important. So if you think about some of those symptoms that we have, um, and I, this might be too personal, so you may not want to do this, or Cindy might want to chime in here. 
but think about something that you've noticed that maybe you've done. And I'll start out using an example with Azul. So everybody that I work with knows I have chronic migraines. That's I'm not, I don't hide that. It's a, it's a fact of life. So one of the things that actually, it wasn't until my last service dog started picking up on it, I didn't realize. I have a variety of different types of migraines and there's one in particular that it flips a switch in my brain that makes me annoyed. So I don't care how nice you're being to me or what you're doing to try to help me. I am totally going to be annoyed at the world, no matter who you are. And I didn't even realize that this was happening to me. And I, who knows how long I did it. But my last service dog would. So she kind of took it on herself to either. She would either act like she was scared, which originally I thought she was, but I was later able to tell she was acting, or she would act like she was about to take a poop in whatever place we were at, which I mean, she was totally potty trained and never had an accident, but she would act in one of those situations. And so that would get me out to the car. And when I left the situation and got out to the car, then she would start automatically doing things to try to get me to calm down. And it wasn't until she repeated this behavior, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 times that I started to see the pattern that as she got me calming down and not annoyed with the whoever happened to be around me, that it was, a, you know, once she got me calmed down, she could then do a migraine alert and it always triggered that certain kind of migraine. So being able to connect those dots and her being able to help me in that way. And she was not trained to do that, obviously, because I didn't know I was happening, you know. Mm. So now I have a new service dog and I'm aware that my body has that issue with that one particular type of migraine. And so he is also trained to find an exit, but he doesn't have to mimic uncomfort in order to get me to go to the exit. You know, he just has to, like, he does not pull on the leash when we're in public. There's two reasons he ever pulls on the leash. And one is, um, you know, there's another dog really close that he wants to just get around a corner enough to see, which is rare. And that's totally different because his nose is up in the air and sniffing. Or two, he's pulling me toward an exit. And so there, there's no sniffing involved. There's no, he has no excitability to him. He's just leading out. And so that's based on me realizing the symptom from my first service dog and teaching him what I wanted him to do, which is kind of the thing that I want to be able to show in this workshop, how you can make progress. So I don't know, Holly or Cindy, one of you have a story or something similar to that effect, something that you do that your dog then helps you with now? Well, my retired service dog, my current service dog hasn't been around my, the trigger, this trigger, it, that enough to trigger for the trigger to go off. But there's a, can be a lot of tension between my parents and myself. And my mom is prone to just having complete meltdowns. And um, with my last service dog, uh, Poe, who was a great Pyrenees, she doesn't like conflict. And she always made a point of getting between my mom, who would be losing it, and whoever else was in the house, and blocking and move it, trying to remove us from the situation, because she would rather remove everybody than mess with the person who's just going off and it, also she was trying to provide comfort at the same time which I thought was really interesting she's not exposed to that um, and she's you know she's retired she's off doing other things now but it, it was really interesting to watch her develop this and it got to the point where if she was around my parents, she was always between my, my mom and dad. She was always kind of hurting my dad away from my mom. So. Mm, amazing. They're so they're just amazing animals, aren't they? Just wonderful. Yeah. 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 As I was just going to say, I think that there's, some, I mean, I think there's some cognitive decline with my mom because she's in her eighties, 
um, she's always had some issues like this, but it's worse. So to see the dog actually physically, no, we need to separate kindly was interesting. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think from my own experience, the best one I can think of, so where I live, the main part of the house is ground floor and then the bathroom's actually in the basement down a set of stairs. And I had a certain kind of PTSD trigger that I knew was gonna trigger a flashback. I would go downstairs to be away from the dogs because I felt like I didn't have as much control over myself and I didn't want to be, you know, put them in harm's way in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and what my Pyrenean mountain dog, same breed, started mm -hmm. to do, only in that situation, not when I was just going for a shower or normally, right. is she started to um, headbutt the door and scratch the door. Um, now she couldn't get in because the door opened the other way. Right. Um, but actually right. that sound was enough to kind of bring me back to a, a better place, that just the sound of something interrupting my thought process. Um, and then I'd be able to go back up. And so I actually started rewarding her for that. I didn't want to open the door and let her down because I still wanted to have that distance. But I knew that she would headbutt the door until I came back upstairs um, or scratch it with her paws. And then I rewarded her for that choice. So that became, it was something that she initiated, but it became almost like a trained behavior in the end and um, that she would do that for enough time to kind of bring me back down. and then. I could go up and, and be with her. So yeah. Mm -hmm. They're one it's wonderful breed. Gorgeous. Nice. Yeah. So I do also want to take a look at so we know our dogs are very helpful. They come up with some creative things to help us on our own. We train them to do some things that we know will help us. But there are some things that we also then also need to consider that we have to be responsible for ourselves. We can't put everything that is happening to us on our dogs that's just too much weight for their kind shoulders to bear basically so I want to just talk a little bit about those types of things that maybe we can do for ourselves to help us to get beyond the the bad times <laughs> you know the times where we may not be fully in control and so Holly do you have some suggestions you want to start there yeah so I suppose as a baseline, something that I do is I have alarms on my phone for important things. <laughs> so um, my own medication, my one of my dogs has life-saving medication that he has to have every day. And I want to be in a position to be able to, that's my job, that's not my dog's job. Um, it's different if they're alerting to let you know it's because of scent or something like that, that you need to take a kind of um, as needed medication. But for ones that are just taken at a certain time of day, I want to have that responsibility for me personally. Um, I also use alarms in lots of different ways. <laughs> um, I don't I don't struggle with PTSD flashbacks anymore. But when I did, I would have um, alarms set for about kind of five to ten times per day so that if I was in a state where I was kind of not really in the room, so to speak, that would that loud alarm would be enough to kind of jolt me back. So that way, my dog wasn't constantly on because I think the concern that a lot of people have, and I've had this concern as well, that if you do have a service dog, do they have to be constantly ready to go, ready to alert, ready to support us? And the answer to that should definitely be no. I think they need to have rest time, they need to have playtime, exercise, mental stimulation, all of the good stuff that we want all of our dogs to have. Um, so those are a couple of things that I would kind of um, start with. I don't know if you've got some more kind of specific questions that you wanted to ask on that. That one's kind of, it's going to be very variable per person. So, yeah. and I think we'll kind of dive into it a little bit more with enrichment for the dogs a little bit later. But so for me personally, it's um, when it comes to, like you said, alarms, I use a lot of alarms as well. But our dogs are not going to be the ones to say make doctor's appointments for us or ensure that we get there. We have to make that commitment. If we're gonna use a service dog and rely on them for things, we have to think of that as a, a commitment that we're making to them, that we're gonna put our best foot forward to be as healthy as we possibly can. So whether that's seeing the doctor regularly if that's needed, or that's taking your medications regularly if that's needed, or even if like in my case with my autoimmune issues, I know that 
a daily walk is needed. And some days it might be a quarter of a mile and some days it might be three miles, but I know that I need that time out and moving. And so I have to take it upon myself. Now, granted my dogs encourage that one because they wanna get out and get moving as well. But <laughs> I don't want it to be their responsibility to tell me that it's walk time. My last service yeah. dog did that and it was okay because it was her, I know it was her natural inclination. She liked doing stuff like that. And so she did do medication reminders and other things, but that was based on her natural personality to notice those subtle changes. She would even remind me to drink water if I hadn't picked up my water in so long. She would come over and bring me my water. And it's like, you need a drink. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's not my current service dog's personality at all. And so I have to make that my priority to remember to make sure that I have my water everywhere I go, you know, mm -hmm. because not only do I want to make sure that he has his water as well, but if I'm not taking care of myself in the best possible way I can, it makes his job even harder. And that's the last thing I want to do to my service dog. So yeah, I sure. don't know. I don't know if there's any other things along that lines that anybody wants to say, or if we're ready to move on. I have a little technique that I've used for years um, that may or may not work for people, but it's worth a try for sure. So I think sometimes life can feel very overwhelming when there feels like there's a big list of things that need to be done either immediately during the day or during the month. Um, so what I like to do is I take a tiny scrap of paper, no bigger than, than this really, um, and I just write down three incredibly simple tasks. So this could be as simple as brush the top set of my teeth, brush the bottom set of my teeth, rinse the sink. It does not have to be big. It could be, if you're having a good day, it could be, you know, reply to an email, make a telephone appointment and go for a walk, for example. So you, you judge it based on what kind of day that you're having. But the idea is that once you've done the three micro tasks, you cross them off, scrunch a little bit of paper into a ball and then you write your next three and you could even have something like have a nap in there it doesn't have to be an active task but by the end of the day what you'll have is a small pile of those scrunched up bits of paper which you can then pop in your recycling <laughs> um, but it's it gives you a real sense of achievement because you've you've got you've done lots of things and achieved loads rather than when we make a big old list and we end up maybe doing one if anything and then we feel really demoralized so that way as well it's a way of kind of taking control of your life, taking charge of things, feeling kind of empowered, I suppose. And again, it sort of takes a bit of weight off of your service dog or other people who may be supporting you in your life as well. Because um, for me personally, I always want to feel in control of my own life and not leaning on others too much. That's just a personal sense of pride thing that I have. <laughs> so if anyone else feels like that sometimes as well, that's a little technique that might be helpful. I think that really applies to like the dog training world too, because probably one of the biggest guilts owner trainers feel is, oh, I didn't train my dog enough this week or the, today or whatever. So taking that tip and all right, write down. So write down your list of the three things that you want to do for yourself. And maybe you have another paper, a note with three things you want to do for or with your dog. And they could be the same, you know, you're taking a walk could be for you and your dog. We take mm -hmm. a lot of sniff abouts that are just general long line and it's good for both of us. And I can think about my whatever else I'm doing in that day while he's enjoying his wilderness hillside that we walk. And mm -hmm. so it, the things can be on both lists, but that helps you to see that you actually did accomplish something. You may not have worked on your target goal. Maybe you're working on a specific target behavior that you're trying to teach your dog and you may not have gotten to that particular one today but it's okay because you still did your three things that you wanted to do with your dog today so yeah yeah definitely little bits of progress and then at the end of the week it's like okay I've actually done quite a lot because often we forget all of the little things that we've done and we just look at the last day or the last morning and we think oh I didn't train my dog today or I didn't do this thing but actually if you look at the whole week you've done hundreds of things <laughs> so it's nice to have it mapped out sometimes I think it might be handy too like 
if you have a small sand bucket or small trash can that you can keep in a spot that you're frequently sitting by or something so that you toss them there and then at the end of the week you can look at that bucket and go oh wow this is just the things that i've accomplished and that visual it could give you to help relieve some of that guilt i mean i can imagine how helpful that would be and then toss it in the recycle bin and start over but giving exactly. yourself that ability to see that, yeah, I can see how helpful that would be, even for me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cindy, you're muted, I think. Okay, am I, un now I'm not? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I, what I was going to say is, I think it's really important that as handlers, that we do the appropriate, that we don't rely 100% on the tasks our dogs provide to maintain our well-being, I think that we need to have um, techniques that we can use. So if the dog can't go with us someday, you know, the dogs, the dogs, my dog just had surgery. So if the dog just had surgery and can't go out and about, you know, maybe we have, rather than being complete, completely held hostage by that, we're able to still go out because we still have some coping and management techniques that are effective. Maybe they're not as effective as doing them with the dog present doing its task, but that we are able to do that because it's no matter what your disability is. I, um, I had a head injury about seven years ago, a little over seven years ago. And having a dog that can help me pick things up and do a few other things has been extremely helpful, but I can still go out without him. He helps reduce the fatigue, but I have other options if I wanna go out without him to keep the fatigue down. And I think it's really important as handlers that we're aware of and keep that in mind um, so that, you know, it may be a day-to-day -day thing. It may not be, it may be just, Oh, I need to leave the dog home for a week because he just got, he just had surgery and, um, gradually, you know, and then gradually bring them back in. It may be, I'm having issues and maybe I shouldn't be around the dog at this point. Very, very and have, true. And having some, and I don't know how it is in the UK, but it, with inpatient admissions, some facilities will allow dogs on the psychiatric floors and some won't. And I don't know how it is where you are. And I, I can see some advantage to it and I could see some huge hurdles to it mm. based on the facility. Yeah, so over here, um, NHS, which is the public health care, which most people use, um, no you're not allowed to take your dog in with you we do so one of my dogs um is a therapy dog she goes in with me as a psychologist to various um, mental health hospitals as a visitor um but no having your own dog is never an option there are a couple of charities um so there's a couple of what are known as kind of suicide prevention houses where people who are feeling suicidal can go and stay for a two-week period and you can usually take your dog with you there but um, in terms of inpatient admissions, no. Um, and I agree, it's, oh, I don't know how I feel about that because <laughs> to some degree, I think it would be incredibly helpful. Um, I also think if it was me, I would be very, very worried about having my dog in with me for fear of other patients and what might happen there. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one to know what would be the best really there. Uh, yeah, a, go ahead. I can't hear you again. You're muted again. Okay. As a retired nurse and even on a medical floor, I, in some hospitals, I'd be extremely concerned about having a dog, a service dog in inpatient. Visiting is one thing, but inpatient, I'd be concerned because you never know if you have a roommate and what the roommate's going to be like. I've seen some pretty, um, things that in other hospitals would have been transferred to psych in medical floors. So, but I think we need to be, as handlers, we need to be prepared for that. 
Yeah, definitely. And now I'm messing my muting up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I totally agree. And yeah, it boils down to the fact that we as handlers tend to, and we use it, uh, I know that I use my service dog as an excuse to get out of some situations that I may not want to stay in, such as, well, you know, i not really comfortable here, so my dog needs to go potty. You know, I'm just going to say my dog needs to go potty. And we do tend to do that. But when it comes to the point of if we are doing a care thing like that where we're admitted into somewhere we really need to be focused on us and not our dogs in that situation so that's kind of my feeling uh, I haven't been there but I've had family members be there and I'm not trying to criticize anyone who decides they need their dog with them you know because that's a personal handler choice if the place you're going is allowing it then it's handler choice to do it or don't do it but for me personally I think that with my family members that have been in there and the situations that have been dealing with, if that were me personally, I don't think I would want my dog there dealing with it. I would much rather know that they were out having fun, sniffing the wildlife and watching the squirrels and enjoying than being there working through what I'm trying to work through in that situation. Mm, yeah, for sure. Well, the other, as the other aspect of that is you almost need a secondary handler because most of the time even in a medical or surgical situation you're not going to be able to get outside to relieve your dog or walk easily to the bathroom to relieve your dog because you're going to either be in pain or well you're probably going to be in pain or sick and um, I'm looking at having to have some surgery at some point soon and the doctor jokingly said, oh, well, I'm going to have your dog. He likes, he really likes my dog. I'm going to just have your dog in the OR and he's going to help perform the surgery. He was kidding, but he's was like, yeah, make sure you bring your dog. And it's like, I would just as soon have the dog stay someplace else. He can go to appointments. I don't have a problem with that, but if I'm admitted, it's not happening. Mm. Yeah. So that kind of leads us into the next topic that I want to discuss. Um, so in the dog training world, and I'm sure everyone who's followed anything as far as any kind of training, there's a common quote that says, you know, you got to look at the both sides of the leash because that um, those, the emotions travel. So if you have a dog that might be fearful of a certain object, whether that be a dog or even if that's squirrels, whatever it is, it doesn't matter you tend to also then as the dog owner tense up when you see that trigger. And our dogs are also the same way. If we are triggered by something out in the environment, like my husband is very triggered by the smell of cigarette smoke, even if there isn't a cigarette present, if it's on somebody's clothes, it can trigger a migraine that happens instantly for him. And so I've had dogs pick up on that and then decide they don't like anybody that has that smell associated with it. And I've had non-service dogs pick up on that. It's kind of common because they realize something is making you uncomfortable. So we need to kind of be aware of that and realize that anything that we're fe feeling, even if we are still in control of the situation, we also need to, you know, especially when we're in control of the situation, we need to do our best to calm ourselves so that that helps our dogs calm as well. Granted, I mean, we all have situations where we're not going to be able to calm ourselves, but the importance of trying that first to try to help our dogs be the most successful and the other things that are involved in, you know, emotions dogs feel, emotions people feel. I think that's kind of a big topic that a lot of service dog handlers don't necessarily think about. And a lot of dog handlers in general, whether it's service dog related or not, they also, emotions, considering a dog's emotions is kind of new to the training world. And so I would like to kind of talk a bit on that. Holly, do you have any suggestions there? Yeah, sure. So I think 
when you're at the point where you still have control over yourself but you are noticing yourself feeling triggered um like you say it's likely that your dog is also noticing that so having some things in your toolkit so to speak that you can do to try and kind of ground yourself um, and by that I mean just sort of stay present and in control and aware of your surroundings as opposed to becoming very very emotional um, so some simple things that you can do with your dog which can help both of you is some kind of touch exercise that you both enjoy um, so for me and my dog something which I find really grounds me in the moment is um, I'll just plait the back of her long mane <laughs> she's like a polar bear um, on the back of her neck she really enjoys that as a sense because I've got quite long nails so I can kind of run it through and the feel of her fur in my fingers I find really calming as well so that's something that we can do together um, and it kind of if she has been alert thinking oh what's going on it's something that helps to kind of settle and calm her down a little bit as well um, depending on what kind of person you are there's various other things that you can do so it might be as simple as um you know, I'm going to look for four things that I can see in the environment around me. That kind of thing can be quite helpful to kind of calm us when we're feeling anxious as well, or even just acknowledging the emotions and saying them to your dog. So this is something that I was doing with someone the other day. So we were sat in the park together and this gentleman um, becomes quite concerned when children come close. He's given me permission to share this story. So when children come close to him, it kind of unsettles him a little bit. And you could see as soon as he became unsettled, his dog got up from a sitting position, was up on all fours, was kind of glancing around. And you could see how that could quite easily develop into the dog becoming fearful of children potentially as well. So what we did there is um, we got the gentleman to say, I'm a bit frightened, those, those kids are quite close, but to his dog. So almost like having a conversation, um, but one-sided <laughs> and just stroking the dog on the chest as he did it and just saying, that's making me feel a bit uncomfortable. Maybe we'll stand up and walk away and almost talking your dog through and talking yourself through a solution to that problem. So you're maybe getting a bit more distant in the same way as we would get a dog away from something that's triggering them and get a bit more distance. We sometimes need to take, take charge and get ourselves away if we're able to do so or ask someone to support us with that. So that's just a couple of ideas of things that you can do together with your dog. Because often if we're thinking about calming ourselves, it's very challenging to also think about what our dog needs. And if we're thinking about keeping our dog calm, we often forget ourselves. So something that you can do together I think can be beneficial for both of you at the same time is really helpful. That's a really good point too and I started a game with Azul when he was really little and anybody who watches any of my training has probably seen my video of videos because I have multiples of Azul doing a hand target positioning game and the idea of the game originally was to help make sure that I had his focus before we entered into a public environment when he was young and in training. But we still then played it through adolescence to do the same thing, to recapture his focus after something distracted him. And I find that it works in reverse, like now Azul doesn't lose focus very easily, but I have days due to my brain fog where I may lose focus. So spending that two to three minutes of connecting with him on that level, it gets my brain working again by connecting with my dog and boost our, our teamwork skills so that we are more in tune with each other. And then he's also likely to be able to notice in that moment when it's me needing it, not him, I'm likely to maybe cue one thing physically and say something else verbally. And so my dog can pick up on that and realize that he needs to keep doing things and he'll do silly things that I've never trained or cued in the middle of that to try to help get me laughing and relax and focus back on that activity we're doing. And we'll do it until we're both in a good position that we can go back to what we were doing. And so yeah. it works both ways. It started out for him, but now I use it more for me. And yeah, definitely. With um, my dog, he's been a, he's a pretty high drive dog and he's been a, my poodle and he's been a real challenge, especially after coming from having a Pyrenees. And with him, what I have found is that if I've put a, a when I take a deep breath, um, that's a cue for him 
that we need to re that we both need to relax. It helps me relax, and then all, and then he knows that he's supposed to relax. And um, I I actually talk to him a lot, tell him what's going on, where we're going, what we're doing, and that's just something I've always done with all my dogs. I thought that was normal that everybody did it, <laughs> but. Um, the deep breathing, even it, it sometimes it takes more than one breath, and that's a, you know, and that really, but it makes a huge difference. I'm getting your heart rate lower and just getting you a little bit more relaxed. I first learned about doing that with the horses and just settling more, and then they settle more. Mm, I had um, a very anxious boy. He's not anymore. He's he's thankfully um a lot older now and calmer but he was very very worried whenever we went somewhere new and I remember once I had no choice I had to take him away with me to stay in an Airbnb which he'd never been to before tried to go to bed at night he was pacing up and down whining crying crying I tried every trick in the book and then eventually I just lay on the bed I nearly asphyxiated myself because I did it for about 10 minutes but I just breathed in and out really deeply and eventually his breathing started to match mine and finally he lay down and stayed down and eventually fell asleep and since then whenever I've had a very wired um, especially adolescent dog just like you say a few breaths in and out and you start to feel them go oh it's really really lovely to see so yeah not even just service dogs but all dogs <laughs> all mammals dogs. in fact and it, yeah. it's nice to have it on cue too that he knows now that okay relax yeah i think he's laying on his back right now <laughs> I've, taken the to, <laughs> I've taken to using the word goose fava which comes from a movie um anger management and the psychologist was suggesting his patients say it because it means nothing and that's exactly what i use it's a cue to my dog that means nothing means okay we're both a little elevated right now let's just basically chill but i mean he can continue to do anything so he can sniff he can heal he can go in between my legs this is one of our silly happy places he can do whatever he wants but we're gonna stop and try to disengage from everything that's overstimulating us in the environment and so it just works and sometimes i say it once and sometimes i say it three or four times but it's that it's that same kind of thinking. It gets us back to where we are all, where we need to be instead of losing it or you know, getting more stressed than what we need to be. So it's good to be aware of that. So let's look at it for a moment. Um, since we've been talking a lot about stress, we know that in the dog training world, there's at least three and probably more, but at least three easy things that can help lower our dog's stress. That being chewing, licking, and sniffing. Basic dog behaviors that can help them to lower their stress bucket for the day. So I think it's important when we have service dogs, whether we're using them for alerting purposes or anything, even if it's a dog that's trained to alert for hearing noises or you know, to guide the blind person, it doesn't matter what it is, we all need to be taking steps to give our dogs those opportunities to do dog things, you know, to de-stress. And so I wanna just take a minute to look at some of our three as a collective group, some of our favorite things to do with that. And um, Holly, I'll let you go ahead and start. So this isn't actually mine, but this is something that Matt Donovan um, taught me and I just thought it was just inspired. <laughs> so um, a lot of people are familiar with the licky mats that you can get. So a square of silicone or rubber, you put something wet on and the dogs lick it out through all of the various little crevices, which is quite nice and calming. And it's just one of those things that I think a lot of us might use them for dinner or during the day or something like that. But what Matt does is he, cuts a big square into lots of little tiny ones and takes them out and about 
so if he's out on a walk with his dog and his dog maybe has a bad interaction with another dog or anything that, that's a little bit worrisome, he just produces this tiny square from out of his treat bag and feeds him. So it's not, um, you don't need to take a big cumbersome mat out with you, but you've just got a tiny little piece that you can pull out of your pocket and just let your dog have, I don't know, one to two minutes of just licking that bit there. So I thought that was incredible. I've been telling everyone. <laughs> um, so that's a really, really nice um, kind of spin on traditional kind of things because I think out and about nose is usually the one I tend to go for we can maybe sprinkle some food and some long grass for our dogs or it doesn't even need to be food motivated a lot of dogs would just be happy sniffing the scents that are out and about so I took my three out this morning and there's lots of lovely luscious long grass that sprouted up in one of the parks that we go to and they were grazing like little horses for a good 15 minutes and I just stood there like yeah, okay <laughs> take your time so I think the real key to these kinds of activities is allowing enough time and patience because if the purpose is to provide a genuine authentic calm experience for the dog we don't want it to be on the clock if, if we possibly can so if we can allow enough time for them to really enjoy that and get the most from it I think that's the key for me so it's it's about the kind of the longevity of the exercise as well as just doing it I wouldn't want to just give my dog a Kong for example for the sake of giving it to them I want it to be meaningful if that makes sense all right um you brought up a couple of good points that I have some but I want to see if Cindy has any other um you know, enrichment type things, things that you have found that, or tips that really work for you well, and we, Nick or Paul. <laughs> we have kind of scheduled chew time because my days, I never know what's going on. And Nick doesn't always, Nick is fussy. Um, he only wants food when he wants food. And like if there were slugs and sauteed escargot he wouldn't bother with the, the slugs he'd go for the escargot where you know the labs would be going for the slugs and then maybe the escargot um he's got the poodle brain so i kind of regular quiet thank you nice um i sorry um i regulate his i, I don't want to say regulate we have scheduled two time so we do some stuff at bedtime and then he gets his chew and we do that every night and sometimes during the day if it's a particularly stressful day or there's something else going on we'll get another chew we also do quiet i know um we also do licking mats and those are usually in the evening as well it gets the rest his regular food during the day and then he gets uh, um, his, the, the, as soon as I'm off mute, he starts barking, quiet, <laughs> nice. Um, so we do a freeze dried powder, um, uh, dog food with supplements in it and uh, with some calming supplements and some joint, some joint supplements and, he gets that in the evening as well. And that kind of makes tops off his daily food requirements. So, so but, everybody knows that I do a lot of sniff abouts or sniffy walks, whatever you want to call them. I always call them sniff abouts because that's pretty much it. We go out and we just wherever, whatever direction the dogs go in. And I have two dogs. Azul being my younger one tends to be the one that leads us wherever we're going. We have kind of, from our house, we live rural on some property about 10 acres and have lots of nature around us outside of that 10 acres. So we have like three main paths that we go on when we step out the door to start with. And so I might guide the dogs to which one might be most appropriate for the time of day. But once we set off in that direction, we follow Azul and do what he wants to do because Cam's happy to just follow as well and go wherever he'll still do all the same enjoying but Azul is the one that's opinionated so we let him lead and follow his nose and whatever is of interest of him that day now if he had his choice when we first stepped out the door Azul would always every day head up to our hillside 
And that's because that's the spot where he can dig for moles and there's field mice and there's a lot of wildlife in that area. So we can come across any kind of remains from last night's coyote kills or things the eagles have dropped and whatnot. So that's Uzzle's favorite place to sniff about. But besides the actual outdoor walking sniff abouts, we also do a lot of indoor, um, basically free work is what most people would call it. We might hide treats or I might hide one of Azul's favorite toys somewhere. And then kind of just like then, if it's a toy, for example, treats are easy. I can just tell him, go find it. And most of his toys he has by name, I can tell him to go find it. But to make it free work, I'll specifically hide a toy, like say I need, need to do the dishes. So then I'll go hide that do toy in the kitchen, knowing that my dogs are gonna join me in the kitchen when I go do the dishes. And they'll stumble across that toy they haven't seen in a while. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like it's their birthday party because they have this <laughs> cool, great thing. And here it was just laying in the kitchen and they didn't know that. You know, obviously they don't know that I'm purposely hiding them and making them that available unless we are specifically doing it with a find it game. But so we do a lot of that activity in the house to give them that chance to kind of just have some fun and have them think that it's, you know, what their idea, it's what they want to do and it's the next thing. So I can lead what our next activity is by those few simple things I do just before it to make it easier for them. Yeah, you, I think one other thing, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna add one other thing. Um, and that's often people come to me and say, oh my gosh, my dog, he really loves ripping things up. I, I leave a cardboard box and he's ripped it all up. Is that okay? And I say, yes, <laughs> because destroying and ripping um, is a natural part of a lot of dogs' predatory sequence. It would be the end of the predatory sequence if we actually had a prey animal. Um, but dogs can learn the difference between ripping up your shoes and your slippers and ripping up a box that you've given them. So actually that can be a huge stress and anxiety release for a dog to actually be able to just rip through some things, maybe find some treats that you found in there. Um, so yeah, I'm always eager to provide that if I've got the kind of dog that finds that stimulating. Some don't. One of my dogs couldn't care less. She'd just look at it and walk away, but one really, really enjoys it. So yeah, that's useful as well. The I was going to say the other thing that I do is I've got a couple of um, feeder toys and some days they're really of high value and some days they're of lesser value. Yesterday they were high value and apparently they were hidden under the couch. I'm not sure how far under the couch, but there was a poodle almost completely under the couch getting retrieving <laughs> toys and then bringing them to me to have them filled appropriately. So, and he doesn't do that every day. I, I kind of let him choose how much he eats. I, he never starves. He has a certain amount he gets in the morning through, uh, through a variety of ways. But if he's asking for more during the evening, you know, during the afternoon, he gets it. And they he need because he needs something he either needs the game of getting it or he needs the actual food or sometimes both <laughs> yeah with him <laughs> with him he tends to run on the leaner side and you know poodles are leaner but he's lean for a poodle so i don't have a problem giving him extra weight or extra food my pyrenees is another story she tends to run on the heavier side and she's 120 pounds, so I'm a little more concerned about how much she gets. No, I think those are great tips. Um, if somebody is interested in more information about enrichment activities or things that will help your dog de-stress, I do have a blog about that on my website at uberpaws.com there's a search feature. So if you search the word enrichment, it's gonna pop right up. Um, but it gives you a lot of creative suggestions and ways to make enrichment more about the activity and less about the food you might be, in, you might be using in that enrichment. So if you're interested, it's there. Um, we've talked a lot about humans 
and how they um, use their service dogs and different things that dogs can work to, you know, do to help us and things that we can do to help our dogs. But I kind of want to look at another thing that's not really talked about too often in the service dog world. And that's the possibility of using um, what some might call a service human. You know, there are certain situations where maybe I don't want to take my service dog with me or I'm going to a personal residence and that person doesn't want my service dog there or maybe going to like um, my niece recently got married and her dogs were going to be there and they don't do well around other dogs. So I had to consider, do I go and take my service dog? Do I go and leave my service dog home? You know, so there's always those situations. And I think we need to help people realize that just because you have a service dog, it doesn't mean you have to take them with you everywhere, every day for the rest of your time together. So um, maybe if you just have any um, stories or feedback or suggestions and criteria that you use as far as when you decide that you do want to take your dog or don't want to take your dog and you want to take the helper a human helper instead um, so that our people can kind of think about that aspect of it as well, because that's for one, that is going to be something that's different for every single person. It's a personal handler decision. So there's not a right or wrong kind of answer. There's some places that I simply don't think would be safe for my dog and I wouldn't take him, but other people might deem those places safe for their dog. So it's not a, a, black and white answer it's more of a generalized what what kind of situations do you use when you're trying to decide should I take my dog or should I take a service human or maybe it's a can I handle that on my own kind of situation I don't care yeah. who goes first <laughs> I think there's there's a ton of situations um for me like you were just touching on I think safety is is really important um so for me personally I have to go every two years um for a full day appointment at a heart hospital to have an MRI and various checks done on my heart and the MRI alone is I think just over an hour inside the machine and I just wouldn't expect my dog to sit next to that without being able to see me or my body or anything I wouldn't be able to see what they were doing and it would feel very worrisome to have them in that scenario so situations like that I think that's when I would say yeah I'm not going to take my dog along to that but completely separate from that it may be that your dog has had a really full-on week maybe you've had appointments Monday through to Thursday you've gone to see friends you've you've been doing lots or perhaps you've just had a really training heavy week and you look at them on Friday morning and you think no <laughs> not today that's when I might actually think oh maybe I can take a, a human helper with me or like you say is this something that I could do on my own so I think it's not always necessarily the situation but it's also how full that dog's week or couple of weeks has been before then as well and if they're in the best place to support you on that day that's a very good point too it may not be situational based it might be you know your recent history based and like Azul had, typically I, I'm retired and I skip, make my own schedule. So Azul, general rule of thumb, a long work day is about two hours for him outside the house. <laughs> and so the other day we actually did a therapy dog situation where we were in a high school um, doing some education about service dogs for Mental Health Awareness Month, which is going on right now. And so we were there about seven hours. It was a little, just a little short of seven hours, which is a really long day for Azul. And so I pretty much knew that the next day, what we did have something scheduled, but we purposely had it scheduled so that it was like five o'clock at night. So he had all morning the next morning to do either laying around the house or the dog things that he wanted to do. So, you know, we did fun stuff. We did some games, we did sniff abouts, and we did a lot of just chill time. But he drove that schedule. And then our activity that second day was simply a one hour activity and it involved a friend and it was all happy stuff. And so I try to take that into account quite regularly, but it's something I hadn't thought to convey to 
my clients yet. So that was a very good point. So thank you for that. Something I did, but didn't realize I need to be telling other people to do as well. <laughs> but yeah, so. Yeah. The other thing is the overall health of your dog. If your dog has to have something done, like Nick was neutered last week or a couple of weeks ago. And that was, it, that, that was just something that was part of the agreement from the breeder because he's a poodle and stuff that it, it, it was part of the requirements of him. And that's fine. I had no issue with it, but he had to be, off week for almost or off work for almost two weeks because he really swelled up as a result. So most of what he was going to do was go to a couple of classes that involved obedience training because he's competing in rally. So it wasn't a big deal for us to go, okay, you're staying home. And then I used to serve as human when I went other places. The other situation that I think it's really important to acknowledge is if you're going to an event, a private event, at least in the United States, if you're going to a private event on private property that is not open to the public, your service dog is not automatically invited. If somebody tells you you may bring your service dog, then yes, you can bring your service dog. But that's a, that's to me, that's an automatic no. Like I, um, went up to, we were up, we were up in the foothills at a ranch, a private ranch, and they were having a, a bucking event that was a private event. All the riders that were competing in this event were invited by the owner of the ranch, and they were people that rode out there, that practiced out there on a regular basis. And the they had a... Um, Oh, what do you call them? They had a like a gymnastics team, or vault. It wasn't a vaulting team, but they had another the girl, the rodeo girls that would go around doing a trick riders. Word finding problems. The trick riders out there, and so there's horses out there. All the horses were basically friendly and used to being hand, handled a lot, but there were other dogs out there. I hadn't talked to the property owner. I hadn't talked to anybody else. And I just said to my boyfriend, I said, it would, I said it's just easier not to take him. I said, you can be my service human. And he was. So like I had all my drinks brought to me. I had all this, I had all kinds of extra attention. So sometimes it's just easier to do that rather than get into a fuss and if it's family you're having it, you're dealing with, like say your parents or your sisters or your brothers or your cousins don't want you to bring the dog over for whatever reason, you don't have the right to bring the dog over. And you, at that point, you have to make the choice of do you take the dog or not? Or do you or take you the dog the or not go? Go or not go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I. And Go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, I tend to find that like most of my friends and family are very acceptive of my dog, even if they don't think I'm disabled enough to need a dog, they're still acceptive of the dog in general. So I don't deal with that too much. However, I think you also have to think about what are your dog's needs in that environment? And are you going to be able to meet those needs? Or are you going to be too distracted? For example, if it's a wedding and you're in the wedding, you're probably not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time focusing on your dog unless the bride has agreed to accommodate the dog as part of the wedding, you know, so you have to think about those kinds of things as well as, you know, I know my dog has its own certain things, they may need to potty, they need to eat, they need to drink, they need time to rest, all of that. Can I provide for my dog in that situation? Or should I consider sending my dog to a babysitter or, you know, something like that for that time period instead? And how much are they actually going to task, be, and be needed for tasking in that environment? I think that is something, the biggest concern. And we need to, as handlers, we need to realize that 
you know, maybe I, at home, I always get the dog to pick up whatever's on the floor for me. Do I really need to get the dog to pick that up in public, in, you know, at this event? Or if I drop my fork, can I wait until I'm done, get another fork and wait until I'm done eating and kick it out from under the table and get it? Yeah, I think that's a very valid point too. And that's, I thought of that when Holly was talking about the MRI. Um, you know, that's a really good thing to consider when you're taking your dog for certain tests. Like I've taken his rule to certain tests like x-rays and whatnot, because he can downstay and he's actually broken his downstay to task in the middle of an x-ray, which I totally support because the tasking was more important than holding the position. But when you're having a, like an MRI or a CAT scan or something, you don't want them to task in the middle of it. If there's doctors that, you know, those tests are done in a hospital. If there's doctors and nurses around, they may not be able to do as good of a job of helping you as your service dog, but they can still help you. They're going to see that you don't die. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to kind of judge that as well. Like, is my dog going to be able to task in this environment? And is it going to be an environment where I'm going to need that task and there's no other options available kind of thing. So I think those are all kind of really important things to look at when you're training your dog to do medical alerts or any kind of tasks. Those are things you need to consider ahead of time. Yeah. And is sure. that task actually life-saving task or not? because I hear that all the time from people, my dog saved my life as far as task wise. And I, I just, I think they help. I think they do a lot of go a long way to help, but unless you crash from 70 to 40 real, you know, in the blink of an eye, I don't think even a diabetic alert dog is going to make, it's going to help you get the blood sugar quicker maybe, but you're I don't think it's necessarily going to be make the difference between saving life your life death. or not. Yep. That's a fine line for, you know, depending on what people's disabilities are, I'm sure, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like with my migraines, Azul can make or break whether I can still function in that day when he's with me. But, but for instance, like one of my things is every, People know I do a monthly migraine shot. That's my best first defense. And then I have a preventative that I can do. And that preventative lasts 24 hours. So I can only take it 24 hours. So it's not shot time. And I've already taken that preventative. And I need to do something that maybe, you know, I'm wondering if he should go or not. Well, if he does give me a migraine alert, I mean, I already have a migraine alert. I'm already functioning. There's nothing else I can do about it at that point except for maybe not drive, you know, but so you have to kind of look at those things too. In order for a medical alert to be a true medical alert, there has to be some kind of a step you can do after your dog does that alert to prevent your condition from getting worse in that moment. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if there's nothing you can do, that's not really helping the situation to have your dog there. So it happens quite frequently when I'm talking to somebody about migraine alerts. So they're like, well, how do you tell your dog to stop alerting? If you're having a migraine that's lasting four hours, are they alerting nonstop for four hours? And I have migraines that last sometimes five days and Azul alerting nonstop for five days would just, it would make anybody happy, you know? So you have to kind of look at that too. But so if there isn't something you can actively do that's going to help that, it in that environment that you're going into, it may be an environment that you want to look for something else to help besides your dog. Yeah, and in the case of a diabetic going into something like that, they really need to do something. They need to make sure that they've got, you know, got their snacks with them and they need to make sure they eat on time and you know, have, do the preventative stuff that they can do so they don't have those issues if they can't take their dog with them. And I mean, we're kind of talking perfect world situation. And right. this is what's important to us. So you may have totally different things. Um, Holly, do you have any other tips or suggestions you want to add here? Um, I think that's a really interesting point because it is so different for, for everybody, isn't it? Um, I think 
it does just come down to that individual analysis and it's something that can change as well because I know that I'm a very different person both physically mentally emotionally today than I was five years ago or a year ago so it's constantly analyzing what your needs are and what your dog's needs are as they develop and get older as well we spoke right back at the beginning about um trying not to kind of expose young or adolescent dogs to certain things and how that can be really difficult but as they move through adolescence and adulthood and then start to age a little bit and we're thinking about maybe retiring a dog it's things are going to change and tolerance levels are going to change for all of us in that situation as well so just being aware that you can reassess and reappraise and what might have been suitable last year maybe isn't this year I think that's good to keep in mind as well I think COVID kind of really opened a lot of people's eyes on that one with the shutdowns and things that we had to do differently and then the all the consideration of, okay, if I need to go do this and I'm wearing a mask and everything, is it safe for my dog too? So I think that helped a lot of people think in that kind of general term of life can change and circumstances change. So we may need to decide what's better for us in this moment. So I think we kind of touched on a lot of the points that can help a person think about you know what is going to be suitable for them as to whether they want to take their dog to this place or that place and you know is the dog trained sufficiently for this place and that place kind of thing and that's kind of the bigger thing I wanted to get stressed because that's very important for all service dog handlers as well so um, I think we covered our whole list which is great I know we talked a little bit more than an hour as well so <laughs> If there's anything else, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I think we covered most of what I want to make sure everybody knows about before the workshop we have coming up. Yeah, sounds good, I think. All right. Well, thank you, Holly. We really want to thank you for joining us. It's nice pulling in some other voices from places that maybe aren't in our normal, regular day-to-day -day circle of people we chat with. Mm. I think that always helps get a different perspective on things. And so, yeah, if you ever need our help in some way in the future, let us know. We're more than happy to help you with something. If you've got projects going on, you want help with as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for being willing to come. Yes, thank you very and much. No worries. You guys all have the great rest of your day. I know Holly, your day's about